Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Uh, today we'll be talking about the basic understanding of explain and analyze. Um, this is a very introductory talk. There we go. That's a good start. All right, so this is an introductory talk, and this is literally for people that have got almost no experience in uh, using Explain Analyze. Can I please have a show of hands of anyone who's got more than six months of experience in Postgres? Okay, all of you can leave. Uh, the rest of you can stay. All right, okay, cool. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Justin Navi. I'm 24 years old. Um, I'm not a developer. I'm not a core contributor. I'm an ex or retired waiter from Spur. So if you want schnitzels, I'm your guy. Um, so yeah, the reason I'm here today, I'm not lying, my boss didn't make me do this. This is against my own will. I'm a slave. Um, so the reason for this talk is just to try and help anyone that's never seen Explain Analyze, just get a basic grasp or an idea of what they're seeing when they look at Explain Analyze for the first time. So that's the goal for today, is if you've never seen it before, for you to be able to walk away and understand what you're looking at. Uh, the more advanced guys, you can maybe help me through about the talk. Okay. So this is the company I work for, GoodX Software. It's a wonderful company, except my boss makes me do things against my will. Uh, we provide medical software for um, anybody in the medical industry. This includes hospitals, uh, clinics, or anything of that sort. It's a wonderful company. All right, so before you go, and I'm serious, it's actually a nice company. I wasn't being sarcastic. Uh, before we get any further, this disclaimer. So often throughout this talk, you'll hear me say this will work well in these conditions, or this is great, or this is slow, or this is not great. Um, that's really only, that depends on your situation. That depends on the environment. That depends on the use case. So I'm just saying, like, that really, in these you know, situations where it's really basic, this is what I've found. Okay. Like, uh, did you guys see the Springbox one? It's always good. All right, story time. You've been tossed writing a query, you successfully get the query to return the data that you would like. It's not quite correct. I know it's a very vague term. What now? How do you go about understanding what's going on? Next slide. Let me just have a sip. Oh. No, I'm joking. That's not really going to do that. All right. Okay. So, the most powerful tool at our disposal for understanding and optimizing SQL queries is explain analyze, which is a Postgres command that accepts a statement such as select, update, or delete. Executes the statement, and instead of returning the data, provides a query plan detailing what approach the planner took to executing the statement provided. All right. So, let's just have a look at, so before we get into, delve into the how, how what looks, or whatever the case may be, let's understand how you use explain analyze. So, um, here's a little something that I copied from the PG docs. Um, that's how it looks. So let's just quickly walk through that. So as my meme might imply, uh, if you use analyze explain or explain analyze apologies, it will actually execute your statement. So if you do a select, it will discard the results, but it will actually execute the delete statement or the update statement or whatever the case may be. Um, so you might wonder why a person would use this. This is good for if you want to see if your actual times are close to the times that's estimated from the explain analyze. This thing sounds super loud, but okay, cool. So that, that's the reason why a person would use that. Um, just be careful of using it. Um, so explain verbose. Um, I think this is something that's anybody, that everybody should use if you're a beginner. It's nice. It shows you um, the outputs of certain, uh, so it'll show you the column outputs that you'll see on joins and all sorts of things. So you can easily pick up on a few um, querying columns that you don't actually need. It's wonderful for that. Um, the next thing that we are looking at is explain costs. By default, it's true. That's why it's in brackets false. Um, this is if you don't want to see cost, this is only if you want to see other things like row estimates and all the other blah, blah, blah. I don't find that very effective at all, to be honest. Um, explain buffers, by default false, has to be executed with analyze. The reason for this is because uh, the query planner has no idea of the buffers until it actually dirties the buffers, hits the buffers, whatever the case may be. Once again, I don't understand that stuff, so it doesn't mean anything to me. Ooh, I can't skip. Um, explain timing false. So by default, the timing is true. Um, the reason why you do, I don't, I can't think of a good reason why you'd put that off. It shows you all your times. So maybe if you only want to see row counts and those types of things. Um, and then we have got explain, and I've just used the example of JSON, uh, format. So by default, it returns the format in text. Uh, the reason for using multiple formats is I know some people enjoy viewing it in JSON, for example. But also something nice about it, what is up with this? This is far too complicated. No, go back. All right, so I know, uh, so the reason for this is sometimes you can um, always pass the result that you got, your result set, into another program um, to help you do whatever you want to do. So at the bottom there, we have an example. Wow. We have an example where you can put multiple parameters together. It doesn't matter which order you do it in. You can just quit it in there. 
and then just have your query on the back end of that. Okay, so now that we understand how to call explain, analyze, or explain, let's move on. So um, this is an example of something that you can take the output from the explain uh, format, and you can put it into this website, tatians.com forward slash pev. I think this is a wonderful website, especially if you're a newbie. It makes it look all nice, and I feel really classy looking at this. Um, something I'd like you guys to take note of is the bad estimate there by the merge join right at the top. Uh, please bear in mind that if your PG statistics are outdated or you're querying a new table, or whatever that may be, the case may be, your estimates could be really bad or they could be wrong or far off. A uh, way to counter this is by simply querying the table a lot of times, like a donkey, or you can run a vacuum analyze on that and that should fix that problem for you. Okay. Who wants fudge? I bought fudge. This is what this box is for. All right. Anybody for some Oreo fudge? Anybody? There you go. There we go. Cool. Moving on. Eat it. Tell us what it's like. What brand is that? Is that fudge, Daddy? Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Here's a, a simple query uh, that I copied off the internet, not gonna lie. Um, so if you want to explain analyze on this, your results will be the following. Cool. Uh, no, go back. There's a meme. Okay, so basically, if you're looking at this for the first time, you should not really have an idea of what it actually means. Um, obviously, the formatting is a bit whack because it doesn't fit on one line like it should with all the uh, nodes. But basically, um, you should not understand this when looking at this for the first time. Um, I had no idea what I looked at, so our goal for today is to try and understand what this, this means when we look at it. All right, so as you can see, um, Postgres builds a tree-like structure of nodes representing the different actions taken. Um, so you can see the little arrows and points. Lovely. Um, there's just a simplified version, once again, of what we're looking at. And as you can see, the, cor the colors correlate with each other on the simplified version, the top query. And as you can see, um, Postgres, or the yellow one, I apologize, you always read the explain and analyze from the inside out, like parentheses or brackets. Um, so in this case, we'd be starting with a bitmap index scan and working our way outwards um, from the lowest node. Okay. Although, sorry, something I'd like to mention is you guys can see there, for example, the sequential scan. I know the purple color is not great. The sequ sequential scan and the hash, although they're on the same level, does it, that does not necessarily mean that's the order that Postgres will be executing those nodes. That could vary, but in this case, I do think that's the case that it's executing that order. Oh, I've got arrows, cool. All right, there we go, that's what I'm trying to say. So that's where the query panel will start when it initially starts running the, quer the query. Okay, now that we can read, let's talk about scans. So scans are basically the um, method used for Postgres to sift and uh, find the data that is being requested. Okay, here are some of the basic commonly, oh, sorry, these are some of the commonly used scans that we'll be looking at today. Um, this does not include everything, um, and we'll be just going over it briefly as a beginner's talk. Can somebody from the audience tell me if there's another type of scan that I have not included today? Four packets of fudge. Come on, anybody. Two packets of fudge? I feel like I'm bidding here. Three packets of fudge, four packets of five packets? Nobody. No one likes fudge. This is going to be hard. Tough crowd. Um, okay, sequential scan. So what is a sequential scan? A sequential scan is the most common or basic scan found in Postgres. Uh, the way it works is Postgres literally iterates the table going through one row at a time. Uh, why Postgres would use this is because it's always available as a, basically a failover method. Um, when re okay, so uh, sequential scans often get bashed on because they are known to be quite slow, and they are, they are not the best. Um, but they can actually be useful when you are reading from a very large table and you're reading, I think, 90 or 95 percent plus of the data. This might actually be the most effective way to do it. And the reason for that is because the data is being read sequentially, and that's often faster than reading it in a random order like an index would do. Uh, when I say sequential, I mean like actually the order which it is on the disk. Okay. So at the top there, um, let me just explain this to you. So the idea of this is just that you guys can see what a sequential scan looks like in the query planner. Um, in the top there, we have just set a flag, enable sequential scan to false. Obviously, like I said, this can't be true. It can't always be false because if it has no other method, it must fail over to a sequential scan. In this case, obviously, there was another method of using it or, sorry, analyzing the query, and that was the bitmap heap, heap scan on example two, the top one that you can see over there. Um, but on, below there, you can see that we've used this sequential scan, and like I said earlier, sometimes this is actually the preferred method, and in this case, it was a bit quicker than the, the top query. Um, it's a very stupid query, I know, but it was actually quicker. Where's that water? Okay. 
Does anybody want fudge for free? Do you want? No, but you couldn't tell me more scans, now you want fudge. How does this work? <laughs> I'm joking, I'll give you, come get it. I promise you, I'll give you, it's good. Um, okay, so an index scan. What is an index scan? Postgres will make use of an index scan in order to read only the data that's, or the portion of the table that's relevant to the query. So if you're not returning the entire uh, table and you're only looking for certain things within the table. Um, so why Postgres would use this is usually if only a small portion of the table is being returned by the qu uh, query, an index scan will be a preferred method, meaning it will be the fastest method. And usually when people talk of indexes, they're talking about B-tree indexes, and this helps the query to find its data it's looking for a lot quicker, particularly using child nodes and equality and range filters. Okay. Okay, here's how the sequential scan at the top. So, uh, it's a little bit of a different query than earlier. And below, you can see that the index scan is quite a lot quicker. But that's not what it's about. I just want you to see how it looks. So when you see it, you're not like, hey, what's this, this new information? Okay, just something I'd like to, um, like you guys take note of. Um, obviously, having indexes increases the amount of I/O required when inserting a row into the table because you also have to write into the index, obviously. Okay. Index only scan, I like this scan, this is a cool scan. So index only scans are like index scans, except for they retrieve all the column information from the index itself. Uh, this would negate the ne need to go back to the table to fetch the row data, resulting in a performance increase. increase apologies. Uh, please note that this is not uh, available to every type of index. For example, gen indexes don't allow this because they don't store all the underlying information. Um, but yeah, this is really fast. My example is terrible, absolutely terrible, but it's a little bit faster. But there we go, at the bottom we have an index only scan. Um, I'd just like to touch on something quickly. Um, currently, as Andres mentioned earlier, we are only working on Postgres 9.5, um, and we have not moved on further than that, so we're not really familiar with parallelism yet. Parallelism, parallelism, yeah, there we go. Um, so obviously, the, sc the scan types of scans work a little bit differently on those uh, versions, and I think it's really cool actually, but we're not gonna be discussing that today. I don't know what that goes on there, but it looks cool. Okay, so a bitmap index scan. So basically what a bitmap index scan does, in short, it combines indexes. So it uses the first index to locate, and uh, locate rows that satisfies the first filter, filter, and then the next to satisfy the fil second filter, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, why this is nice is because it allows you to have great flexibility as it can make use of multiple indexes. So if you're filtering on different columns that are not necessarily in one index, then you can make use of a bitmap index scan. Okay. I don't have a comparison with this compared to times because I feel like this is something that's really dependent on your situation. So I don't want to compare this with the index scan or this type of scan or that type of scan. This is just how it looks. Um, it's not the first node, it's the second node. All right, okay. So bitmap heap scan. Bitmap heap scans fall between um, sequential scans and index scans um, in terms of when it should be used. So it would, return, it would be useful, I think, when you are trying to retrieve data that's too small for sequential scan to be effective, but too large for index scan to be effective. Um, a bitmap scan, is, bitmap scan is very similar to sequential scan, fetching the rows from the table and the physical order they're in sequentially. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that a little bit later. These are normally used when we will read too much data. I just said that, it's cool. Uh, the downside, however, to using a bitmap scan is, like I said, it fetches the data in a sequential order, which is actually on the disk. Um, therefore, you lose any information with the sorting, so you can't really use an order by for this, or it handles it really poorly. Okay. Okay. Lacker. Okay, so there's a scan summary, uh, just something that I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have a little summary of scans, so, yeah, that's good. Can anyone from the crowd here, are you taking photos of my slide? That's wonderful. So you can have fudge. You want fudge? Do you like fudge? You can have fudge. Can I throw it at you? Careful, it's 130 grams of pure goodness. You like strawberry and cream? Yeah, can I wait? There you go. Sorry, that was a little bit odd. My bad. Okay. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah, my note here says hand out fudge. Done. Cool. Okay, we got a little Trump going on there. Who likes Trump here? Anybody like Trump? Any Americans here? Do we have Americans today? Any Americans? You're an American? Are you American? Sorry? You like Trump? You can have fudge, you want fudge? <laughs> Lots of fudge, you can have two, three, five, what do you want? I'm serious. 
Come get. Your friend wants. I can see he wants. Do you guys like Oreo? Turkish Delight, what do you guys like? Do you Turkish Delight? I hear you. You're going to have two. There we go. Pleasure, buddy. I'm glad you like Trump. It's a good, you've got good taste. Okay. Um, all right, so now that we've briefly touched on scans, that now when we look at this, this is the output that we saw earlier, that we didn't really have an idea what we are looking at. Um, and now those things that are highlighted in green, we should have more or less an idea of what they mean, okay, and how they work. Um, there's some other words that they don't quite understand yet. We're going to have a look at now. This thing is a pain. Okay, so let's look, move on to some operations that we have not yet looked at, like nested loop, hash join, and merge join. We're not looking at no nested loop or hash join, or sorry, no hash join or no merge join today. We're going to keep it simple, simple and keep to those three joining methods just for today. Okay, so nested loops. Um, so how a nested loop works is it iterates through all the entries in table X, or your first table, and then iterates through all the tables in entry Y, and then returning a row whenever the pair of rows from all tables satisfy both filter conditions or all filter conditions. Just something to note. I'm just going to throw this thing very far in a second. Um, just something to note is that nested loops always join from the left-hand side, or always do a left join. So they join from the left table always to the right. So if your, if your query is doing a right join, Internally in the query planner, it will swap those around and handle that for you. Um, so again, like a sequential scan, this is a failover method or method. I don't want to say failover, maybe, but this is a method that's always available for Postgres to use. Um, but it's not particularly fast, and I can't think really of a use case why this would be a good idea to use. Maybe someone could tell me. Packets of fudge are up. Can I have a microphone, please? Thank you. Okay, hash joins. Um, that's the sexiest photo of uh, hash brown that I could find on the internet. Please, man. Yeah. Um, so how, how hash joins work is first fetch all the rows from the first table with its filter applied, uh, then construct a hash table in memory containing all of those rows. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and then iterate through the table and check, uh, iterate through the next table and check if the filter that's been applied corresponds with the data in the hash table. Hello. Hello? Is it on? It's on, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. A downside, however, is that a hash join only works when there's a quality condition in place. Um, hash joins are the preferred method uh, if the quality operator is on both sides of both the tables and if the hash actually fits into memory. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you can hear me now, eh? Cool. All right. Um, when we talk about uh, the hash table fitting into memory, uh, we usually talk about two types of memory predominantly when we are beginners, shared buffers and work memory. In this case, we are talking about work memory. Um, this is a pretty fast method for Postgres to do a join. Okay, so moving on to merge joins. So what and how merge joins work? Merge joins work similarly to a hash join. That's all we need to know for this little exercise today. And it does not fit into memory. So why Postgres would use this method is because merge joins, excuse me, merge joins winds up using disk space, uh, excuse me, disk much more effectively than a hash join. So it handles the thrashing of the disk a lot better. Okay, so there once again is a summary of uh, the join operations used in Postgres. Um, does anyone have any information I'd like to share that I did not cover regarding joining methods in Postgres? Come on, a lot of you are pros here. I saw your credentials. None. Who wants fudge? <laughs> who? Oh, seriously, who wants fudge? You guys want fudge again? No. no, you don't want? You want fudge? I must have throw from, yeah, I'll do it, let's go. Freya Rosh, how does that sound? You want? It must have, I will, my man, I'm not scared, let's go. I'm gonna throw someone down. I'm gonna, this is 130 grams. This can damage someone, seriously. They are, these, these lights are way too expensive for me to damage. Come a lot closer, please. Thank you. Pleasure, buddy. Okay. All right, so joint operations complete. <laughs> this is a little meme. Okay. Hey, someone laughed. Jeez, wow, I like it. You guys are cool. All right, um, okay, so now that we looked at, um, uh, some more words that we didn't understand. For example, the hash join and the hash. Now we're starting to see that thing color up a lot more so we, we can start to feel like we're getting somewhere. 
So next we're moving on to sorts. Uh, so as we know, Postgres, if you just do normal select, Postgres will return the data in the method, I mean in the order that was inserted into the actual table. Um, as soon as we start to use the sort, you can actually, um, when you want to start sorting data, you can use an order by clause. Um, this will return the data based on the criteria, ascending by default, or you can tell it to do descending. Okay. Okay, external merge short. So an external merge short, well, yeah, what it is, is used when to sort, when the data does not fit into memory. This is not the fastest sort method, seeing as there's lots of disk thrashing. And um, the reason why a person would actually, why your query planner would fail over to using this is because it could not fit everything into memory. On large data sets, I don't think there's an alternative for something like that. I don't know, maybe you can uh, optimize your query so it doesn't have to do that. But I mean, in a case where you do have to do lots of sorting, I don't know what the solution would be. I don't. Yeah. So why Postgres is use that is because the data does not fit into work mem. Okay. A quick sort. A quick sort is a well-known algorithm, sorting algorithm called quick sort for in-memory sorting. Once again, in work memory. Um, this is extremely fast, and there is quite a few variations to this from the normal vanilla variation that we are used to in Postgres. You can go look at the source code um, and find other variations. I don't know how that works. Um, this will definitely be, so why Postgres would use this is because this would definitely be fast in external merging as all the data is put in memory and then the sorting is done in memory itself. Heap sorts, I hate this. I can't explain this to save my life, I'm going to try. So technically speaking, when using a limit and an order by, um, the query planner or yeah, Postgres has to scan through each and every one of your rows in your table. So. Maintains a heap with a bounded size, then swallows the input values in sequence, then sorts and decides where it fits in the heap. So, for example, you got a little heap with a bound size, and you get all sorts of um, you know sizes coming in now, both your order by. So, let's say it's main ID, and you said um, limit 10 or whatever the case may be, order by main ID ascending. So, you'd want 1, 2, 3 to 10. But now it gets 10, 20, 21, 24, and it fits it into the heap. And as soon as the next um, input value comes that fits within the sequence, it will simply knock off uh, the last um, value off the heap and maintains that size. So I hope that kind of makes sense to you guys. Um, so why Postgres would use this? Once again, theoretically an order by with a limit has to scan all rows and this is faster than external merge and it does make use of some memory. Okay. All right, uh, here's the sorting memory. You know what time it is, it's fudge time. Who wants fudge? You want fudge. You go, this is catching on. I told you. Can I throw it there? Oh! I did not mean to hit you. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, cool. You guys got that. All right, so there we go. We got more words that we understand. That's wonderful. Okay. So we've got scans under our knees now. We've got uh, some of the joining methods used, and we Partly understand how sorts work in the query planner. Wonderful. We're starting to make real good progress here. All right, so costs. What are costs? Costs are mostly an abstract concept. Uh, it's an arbitrary number, meaning it has got no unit. And costs are calculated using database statistics, PG statistics. Postgres always chooses the execution plan with the lowest possible cost value. Um, this is not necessarily correlated with time, but 90% of the times it would be. Um, so let's quickly have a look at our query at the bottom there, our query plan. I've highlighted three places that we'd like to look at. So I think I've got arrows. I've got arrows. Okay, so the first one is the, the cost it is for the query planner. It's estimated cost. These are estimated values. It's estimated cost to return the first row or start up cost. The second value, the 1.75, is its total cost to return all the rows or the last row. Yep. Next, in pink purple, we've got the estimated amount of rows within the node. So it thinks it's going to do a sequential scan for on 75 rows. And the width there is um, the average size of the row in kilobytes. I don't know why that is helpful. Can someone tell me why that's helpful? Why would you want to know that in kilobytes? 
Pardon? But I mean, is anyone going to do that math? Okay, but fair enough. Okay, that's a good answer. Okay, my quick math's not great. That's probably why I wouldn't use it. Okay, let's talk about times. So times, estimated times are calculated using database statistics, like I mentioned earlier with the PG statistics for the costs. Um, the time of an upper level node includes all the cost of its child node. So if you look over here at the hash join, right to the top, its total time is the 8.7, oh, I'm looking, yeah, 8.759. So that includes the sequential scan on DebF detail or the hash or the sequential scan, all those things. So the top node includes all those times below it. Okay. Um, also something I'd like you guys to note is the time at the bottom there. So how this works is the actual time of the actual time that you see within that node, for example, the hash join at the top, um, those two values together should be more or less, if your PG statistics are accurate, should be more or less of your planning time over there and your execution time. Because those are actual values, the actual time with those two numbers, and the bottom, the planning time and your execution time is the estimated times. So those two should be more or less together. Obviously, the shorter your query, the more those two would deviate on a percentage basis, but the larger your query, though, the more accurate that should be. Then, if you do quick math, you'll see the time at the bottom there is not the same as any of those two numbers added together. The reason for that being is that's the total time. So that includes um, additional overhead, which is not um, calculated in the query planner. This can include network time, or the time it's taken to send the data to PG Admin or PSQL, because they're handled in different methods. Excuse me. Whatever the case may be. Okay. So, yeah. I've got arrows. Yeah, I've got arrows again. Okay, cool. These arrows things don't work for me. Yeah. Okay, I'm really quick. I was really quick. I got like how many minutes left? Yo, that is really quick. Okay, let's talk about some stuff. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've got fudge. You want fudge? You want fudge, my man? What fudge do you like? There's some. Um, that's traditional vanilla. Dude, that sounds a bit boring. Do you want like? I don't have rum, but I got whiskey, my man. I got whiskey. Let me give you some whiskey. Can you maybe just help the guy out behind you? There's two. Um, okay, but seriously, do you guys have any questions? I would like to interact. I'm a newbie at this. Um, I don't know everything about this. I was not supposed to do this talk. My boss forced me, and I started preparing too late, as you can see. <laughs> any questions? Uh, he's got a question in the back there. Can you just show that uh, website that you use? Yes, for I the can. Explain, please. Uh, the tatians.com. Give me a second. <laughs> I'll trump. Classic. Whoop, whoop. Apologies, I'll go through that a bit quick. There it is. Nope. There it is. No. Tatians.com forward slash pev. Are there any other questions? Hey, we got a question over here. Yes, uh, just wait for Mike, please. Do you want Fadja? <laughs> um, is my assumption fair on a quick, quick index? That's when you join two tables, for instance, on a common field. And Greg sorts it by, or the Postgres sorts it by default for you. Oh, uh, you're talking about a quick sort now? Yes. A quick sort, okay, a joining method. Let's really go back to that. I'm going forward, my bad. Okay. So you're wondering if a quick sort def by default um, orders it for you on the well, thing that you, well, um, you joined on? You said it applies itself automatically. Does that happen when you do a join on a common field, for instance, and it sorts it by that field? Sorry, what do you mean it, um, it orders it automatically? Did I say that? No, well, I might have. <laughs> if I said that, you must kick me. Just give me a second. Let's just get there. So we're talking about a hash join, right? Is this what we're talking about? Uh, no, the, not the hash join. The quick sort. Oh, the quick sort. Sorry, I'm sleeping. Sort. There we go. Yeah. In what context will you trigger the? The DB to, to use those. Um, so the DB would predominantly use this when um, it's hashed, uh, it's hash, the hash, 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 it's hash can fit into memory. So if it can't fit into memory, it should use this method because it's quite a fast method. Uh, if it can't, it will fail over to one of the other methods depending on your 
clauses. So if you have a limit buy or an audit buy, it should use a heap sort. Um, and the bounded size is what you give it. And if it uses an external merge sort, that would be when it does no longer, when your table that you're joining no longer fits into memory. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Has anyone opened the fudge and ate it yet? Not, okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Ma'am, do you have a question? No questions. Okay, this is really hard to eat time when you guys look at me with a bunch of blank faces. You have a question, yes sir. Can we have a microphone for him please? You can walk really slow, we've got like nine minutes, it's cool. Um, so just a question, you said that sequential sort would be the fastest uh, if you're comparing large data of tables, uh, large tables with a lot of rows in, in it, yes? Uh, when uh, you a, sort? It a, a, sequ a sequential sort would work the, the most effective when you're talking about very large tables with a lot of rows. A sequential scan, yes. A sequential scan, okay. Yeah. That can be effective if you're scanning, um, I think it's 95% or 90% of the table, so that includes all the columns and everything like that, I think. But obviously, if your table is now 30 rows big, doesn't matter. No, well, my question relates to, say, a, a big table with a lot of uh, records in it that is essentially uh, organized by date. So you have, say, records that are in 2015 right at the top, and then when you scan this, it needs to go down directly to the bottom. As soon as you do an order buy, it takes very long because it now needs to do a sequential scan, goes direct and starts at the top and then now needs to go down. How would you get around this? Um, so a sequential scan actually uh, does, it scans the data in the order in which it was inserted into the table. So uh, it could be different to whatever you might see in the front end. Um, but what's actually inserted into DB. So uh, I'm not sure which, like how it would be inserted in your case where it will always be 2015. I'm assuming this is like a history log or something like that. Uh, uh, it, it, for this instance, let's just say it's orders. So the first order came in in 2015. That was, the f like you said, the first time a record was inserted. Yeah. So it starts at the top and now it needs to go down to the very bottom, 20,000 records, which takes very long. How would you get around this issue? Um, okay, so by default, like you said, it would scan from 2015 because that's the first row that you insert, uh, inserted, so it would scan in that order. So your question is, if you are using a sequential scan, which is not always the fastest method, you've got a table of 20,000 rows, and now it's doing a sequential scan, and you want to do an order buy, how would you go about it? How would you, how would you speed that up instead of doing the sequential scan? Um, oh, you can put an index on whatever you want okay. to order by. Okay, so you just add the index. Um, you can't add the indexes on the date. Uh, so I understand. You yeah, so like I said earlier, it's, um, there's no, I can't really just give you an answer like this, like, oh, just put an index on it. It's not going to work. Uh, it, it's definitely per use case. So maybe if we can look together afterwards at your, do you have the table here? Can we have a little squiz? Yeah, which is just uh, opening a discussion. You wanted to eat time. That's true. So. You wanted, and now I'm killing it. I'm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you must understand. You I'm, trying to, I'm, try, I'm trying to assist you here. Um, okay, so my. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I do appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sleeping. Um, so, my answer would be I don't think there's a definitive answer. Can anyone, come on, there's a lot of experienced guys here. I know that you're super experienced. I know who you are. Hello? Hello, where did you guys come from? Uh, I said you can add an index. You said, what did you say? You said you can add an index on a date. Yeah, a Brent index, like a block. I'm just repeating what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hello. Uh, yes, you can actually add a index on a date field. Uh, if it's a timestamp field, you can cast the. You can basically do anything within the index, where you can cast the timestamp as a date in the index, or you can use a Brin index, um, and that would also actually be tree index if you want to actually sort all the records, or like a block index that uh, Hans spoke about uh, in the morning. Uh, so yeah, you can actually add that. Yeah, fudge, please. Uh, sorry, does that answer your question? Yes. He says yes. <laughs> Can sorry. I throw this? I'm going to throw it. 
I think Corvus wants one as well, so heads up. Well, this will be interesting. Those are the maniacs that made me do this, by the way. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Anybody else, any other questions? I'm not going to kill this question this time as quick as I did the previous question. Thank you for that. All right, you've got a question. I do. Uh, I've, got, I've got whiskey and coffee. I've got traditional. I've got, uh, I've got vanilla. You, you, you're a classic man. You want it afterwards? Okay. No, that's my talk, Oaks. It was a lot far longer in my room last night when I was talking to myself. I don't know. I, I wanted to put actually an example in at the end or to show you how we took a query and you know, made it faster just using these three, um, these three examples of scans and sorts and merge, uh, joints, apologies. Uh, but I thought there would not be enough time because I talk a lot usually and uh, yeah, still trying to eat time. Yep.